Okay, welcome back. Here we are with uh, lesson 10, and it's a little bit different presentation. It's what's so cool about A plus and A minus. So we're going to begin with the vPython demo. So sit back and look at the pretty pictures. All right, so here we are looking at the ground state wave function of the simple harmonic oscillator. Let's turn on the probability display so you can see what the probability density is going to look like. Now there is one big difference. This is the n equals zero state of the simple harmonic oscillator. It corresponds roughly to the n equals one state of the infinite square well, except for the fact that the probability doesn't go to zero. It just sort of tapers out here asymptotically. If you zoom in, you can see that, that, uh, that those Cylinders don't actually quite go to zero, but they get pretty darn small. So, now, what we're doing today is looking at the A plus and A minus operators. So let's consider what happens if I apply the A plus operator to this wave function. As you know, what happens is you get the N equals one state, okay? And if you apply the raising operator to that one, you get N equals two, three, four, five, and six. So this is the n equals 6 state of the simple harmonic oscillator. Notice it has 7 humps, and that's because we started counting at 0, which is just the convention for the simple harmonic oscillator. Now what about A minus? A minus is going to take you down a step in energy. A plus brought us up a step in energy each time we applied it. A minus is going to bring us down a step in energy. So if we applied to n equals 6, we're going to get n equals 5, 4, 3, 2, one, and finally back to zero. Now what happens if you apply a minus to the n equals zero state? The answer is you get nothing. Not the <coughs> n equals minus one state, there is no such state. As you remember, you can't have an energy that's less than the lowest potential energy in a potential, and that means that uh, what you get is zero. This actually produces a kind of a trick for generating a simpler differential equation to find the n equals zero state. You write out the a minus operator as a differential operator and you apply it to an unknown function and set that equal to zero. What you get then is a differential equation whose solution is the n equals zero state. All right, so that's what I wanted to remind you of. Let's get back to the slides. Okay, very good. So what I want to do is to bring out some of the uses for A minus and A plus. Of course, there's the obvious use. We can generate new solutions if we have existing solutions. But I also want to point out that it can simplify otherwise very difficult calculations. And it can help us to understand the coupling with radiation. So we haven't really talked about how radiation works, how you treat radiation in quantum mechanics. But I want to touch on that today. We won't treat it fully until next semester when we get to perturbation theory. But uh, we can touch on it today and give you a sense of how these things actually help us. So let me remind you, what are A plus and A minus? A plus is a linear combination of the momentum and the position operator. A minus is a different linear combination. The only difference between them is whether the momentum gets added or subtracted and uh, what the coefficients are. So remember that the capital A coefficient is the square root of 1 over 2m h bar omega, and the capital B coefficient is m omega over 2 h bar. We worked those out last time. And uh, that means that you can write A plus out in detail with the coefficients uh, in this way. And uh, A minus similarly works out this way. Notice that when you get all the i's in, in differential form, there are no complex numbers in a plus and a minus. The complex numbers come from the, or the, the i's come from the definition of the momentum operator and the way it gets added to the position operator. But when you multiply all the i's out, you end up with a pure real differential operator. Okay. Now, uh, what does the machinery do? Think about what happens when you apply a plus and a minus to a wave function. A minus acting on a wave function means you're going to take the derivative of the wave function 
you're going to multiply the wave function by x, and then you're going to add the two results together. So it's kind of like take a derivative, multiply by x, and add. On the other hand, a plus says you take the derivative, you multiply by x, and then you subtract. So the only real difference between the two is one you add, the other you subtract. So let's look at the ground state wave function. The ground state wave function looks like this. It's really just a Gaussian. But if I take the derivative of the ground state wave function, I, uh, I get like a double humped Gaussian. Notice it has a positive slope on the left and a negative slope on the right, and so you end up getting a kind of a double hump thing. Of course, if you multiply the Gaussian by x, you get a similar looking thing, except it's a double hump the other way. Now, what happens if I subtract those two guys? If I take the blue minus the red, say, I get the purple. But that is exactly what the n equals 1 state looks like. That's the first excited state. Now, what happens if I add the two together? I get 0. Notice that 1 is the negative of the other. When you add them together, you get nothing. That means if I apply a minus to the ground state wave function, I get the zero function, which is uh, not a wave function at all. It's zero everywhere. So that's interesting. What happens if we play the same game with the psi equals or n equals one state? Notice that uh, when I calculate the derivative, I get a three humped thing. If I multiply by x, I also get a three humped thing, but it it doesn't quite match. It doesn't quite cancel out. So when I add them. I get the purple function, that's the n equals zero state. But if I subtract them, I get the blue. But the blue is the n equals two state. So you can kind of see how the machinery works. Here it is again with psi two. Here it is again with psi three. Each time notice that when you add the results together, you go down by one. If you subtract, you go up by one. So you can see kind of mechanically how it is that these summing and differencing of taking derivatives and multiplying by x give you the effect of a plus and a minus. Now last time, as board work, we worked out the commutation relation of a minus and a plus. And what do we find? We found that a minus a plus commutator was equal to 1. In other words, a minus plus minus a plus minus was 1, or a minus a plus was the same thing as a plus a minus plus one. So what I'd like you to imagine is um, suppose we have an eigenfunction psi n of a plus and a minus. What I want to point out is that that wave function is actually an eigenfunction of a plus a minus with eigenvalue of n. So let's see how that works. Suppose we create a new function by applying a plus to psi sub n. We'll call that function phi. And what is the eigenvalue of a plus a minus on that phi function? Well, uh, you can answer that. It turns out the correct answer is n, but let's see how it happens. a plus a minus on phi is uh, the same thing as a plus a minus on a plus psi sub n. But a minus a plus is a plus a minus plus 1. We know that's the commutation relation. So I can put that in, and I can factor out an a plus. But notice that uh, when I do that, I get a plus a minus psi sub n plus psi sub n. But remember that a plus a minus on psi sub n is n on psi sub n. And that means that I can factor out the psi sub n. I get a plus n plus 1 on psi sub n. But now n plus 1 is just a number. So I can take the n plus 1 out, and I see that a plus a minus on phi is n plus 1 on phi. So that means phi is a wave function whose eigenvalue of a plus a minus is n plus 1. So what we've just shown 
is that uh, a plus has the effect of giving an n plus 1 eigenvalue of the a plus a minus operator. Now remember, what is the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is a plus a minus plus a half, but we just worked out that a plus a minus is an, is an operator whose eigenvalue is n. Its eigenfunctions are the stationary states. The eigenvalue of those functions is the number of the stationary state. So that means you can think of the Hamiltonian as just being the number operator plus a half times h bar omega. So it's just a different way to work out the Hamiltonian. a plus a minus is simply the number operator. It tells you the number of the state. And uh, you can see that uh, the phi function that we were proposing before is really just the n plus one-th energy eigenstate. Okay, so what is a plus on psi sub n, just a plus alone? Well, we know that it's got to be something times psi sub n plus 1. But the question is, what is the something? What is that coefficient? It's going to be some kind of a coefficient that depends on n. These are not Fourier coefficients, by the way. I don't mean to imply that. They're just some constant that can depend on n. We don't know what that constant is at this point, but we can get it from normalization because we know that w the new wave function, whatever it is, will pick c sub n so that it's properly normalized. So the idea is uh, if we multiply both sides of the equation above, the a plus on psi sub n, um, let me say that again. If you take the result of applying a plus times psi sub n and then check its normalization, what you get is c sub n squared uh, psi n plus 1 star times psi n plus 1. So that's how we're going to work out the value of c sub n squared. But notice that uh, what I have there is the complex conjugate of a plus on psi sub n. But if you think about it, that's the same thing as uh, psi sub n star times a minus, because a plus and a minus are related to one another as complex conjugates. The conjugate of a plus on psi sub n is psi sub n star times a minus. But look what we have in there. We have a minus a plus. I can replace that with a plus a minus plus 1. We, can, we also know that a plus a minus on psi sub n is n times psi sub n, because that's the number operator. So that means that c sub n squared is n plus 1 times psi n star psi n. But we presume that psi n was already properly normalized. And that means that c sub n must be the square root of n plus 1. So we've just worked out the actual result of a plus on psi sub n. It's the square root of n plus 1 on psi sub n plus 1. You can similarly work out the result of a minus on psi sub n. It's the square root of n times psi sub n minus 1. Now, there's an easy way to remember this result. It's the square root of whichever n is bigger. So if I apply a plus, I get square root of n plus 1. If I apply a minus, I get the square root of n. They're different behaviors, but the thing that's the same about them is whichever side has the larger value of n, it's the square root of that. Okay, so we can generate new solutions, but how does that actually make my life easier? Well, let's take a, an example where it does make your life easier. Imagine you want to find the expectation value of momentum when the system is in the state psi 3. Well, psi 3 is a kind of a complicated function. If you write it out as an actual function of x, you can see that it's a um, complicated polynomial times a Gaussian. And calculating the momentum expectation value means you have to apply the momentum operator to that thing. you got to get its complex conjugate and multiply it all out. And it gets pretty ugly. Look at that. Okay, does that look like a fun calculation to do? It's, uh, it's hard. But I want you to notice something. By the definition of a plus and a minus, we can, we can get an expression for the momentum that's uh, simply the difference of a minus and a plus. 
So the momentum operator, in other words, another way to write the momentum operator is to write it as a difference of the lowering and raising operators. With that definition, I can calculate the expectation value of the momentum on state psi 3 and rewrite the integral as an integral on a minus on psi 3 times psi 3 star and an integral of a plus on psi 3 times psi 3 star. But we know what happens when a minus acts on psi 3. It's the square root of 3 times psi 2. And we know what happens when a plus acts on psi 3. It's the square root of 4 times psi 4. But square root of 3 and square root of 4 are just numbers. So what that means is that um, we end up with these integrals that look like the orthonormality condition. Psi 3 star on psi 2, psi 3 star on psi 4. But what are those? They're just 0. And so what is the expectation value of momentum? It's 0. Okay, that was easy. Let's, uh, let's look at another example. What if I wanted to know the expectation value of momentum squared? Again, this would produce a hideous integral, very difficult to do, because it's a third order polynomial times a Gaussian. I can take derivatives of that thing all day long. It's never going to go away. And so momentum squared, it means taking two derivatives, so it's going to be very complicated. But if I write the momentum out as a relationship among the raising and lowering operators, it becomes a simple sort of quadratic thing with raising and lowering operators. But I want you to notice something. A minus squared acting on psi 3 is going to give me psi 1. Psi 3 star on psi 1 is 0. A plus squared acting on psi 3 is going to give me psi 5. And psi 3 star on psi 5 is going to be 0. So I know right away that these two terms aren't going to contribute to the result. But what about the middle terms? I've got an A minus A plus. I've got an A plus A minus. Those are going to bop me down and bump me back up, so I'll end up with a psi 3. But the only difference is I'm going to have uh, a negative 3 because I'll get uh, the square root of 3 twice. The other term, I'm going to get the square root of 4 twice. So what I wind up with is just minus 7. And uh, of course, there's a minus sign outside, so the answer is 7 over 4a squared. That's super easy. That's so much easier than actually writing out the integral. So there's another thing you can do. You can rewrite x as a superposition of a plus and a minus. What is a plus plus a minus? Well, it's 2bx. That means x is a plus a plus a minus over 2b. And I can use that to calculate expectation values of x, which is also very difficult to do using the explicit algebraic formulation of the uh, of the wave function. Let's talk about radiation coupling. The electric field propagating through space looks like some kind of a propagating wave, but for visible wavelengths the uh, value of k is going to be um, very very small with a wavelength of like 5,000 angstroms with the size of an atom of like 3 angstroms when I calculate k dot r, it's going to be on the order of a 1 1,000th. And that's a very tiny compared to the uh, effect of the electric field. So I can basically ignore the k dot r for long wavelength radiation. And I get the electric field in the vicinity of an atom is approximately a constant in space. But of course, it's going to vary in time. So I can rewrite the potential as being um, a constant electric field in space dotted into the position of an electron. So the potential is going to depend on time, but, uh, but it's not going to depend strongly on the space. Let's say the potential will just be proportional to, to the distance. Okay? Um, the question is, how do I deal with a potential that depends on time? We're going to find out next semester how to do this in detail. But basically what we do is we write the potential, we write the Hamiltonian as a part that's the static simple harmonic oscillator potential and a part that's the interaction potential. And then instead of expanding psi as a 
bunch of Fourier constants times the basis functions, we, we write it out as a bunch of constants that can have a time dependence. So these are Fourier coefficients that can depend on time. And then if you plug all that back into the Schrodinger equation, you get an equation for the time rate of change of these coefficients. And now what I want you to focus on, and we'll, like I said, we'll cover this all next semester, what I want, to f what, what I want you to focus on is the fact that the, uh, there's a part of the time dependence of the coefficients that goes like the interaction Hamiltonian. It's like the expectation value of the interaction Hamiltonian between two of the basis states of the superposition. And uh, it gets a little bit complicated, but the main point is that you need to calculate the expectation value of x between two different um, stationary states. And that will determine the rate of change of the Fourier coefficient for one of those states. But remember that we can write x as a superposition of raising and lowering operators. That means that uh, I end up with a couple of integrals, one with an a plus and one with an a minus. And you can see that the integral on the left is only going to work if n is 1 less than m, and the integral on the right is only going to work if m is 1 less than n. So what this implies is that transitions are only going to be strong in those cases where the wave function um, where the transition is going between an n and an m that differ by 1. So we're going to go back to, uh, to vPython now for a little demo of that. OK, so here we are back looking at the ground state. I just wanted to point out what happens when you get a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state. You can see that you get that familiar sloshing. But it's that sloshing that gives rise to the radiation. So the, the point is um, the expectation value of position is going to vary in time when you have a superposition of two states that differ by one in their energy eigenvalue. So here we are looking at 2 and 3. You'll notice a similar effect here. 3 and 4, similar effect there. So if I have just 1 and 3, they're not neighboring, they're uh, like this, you still get sloshing, but notice that it's symmetric with respect to position. So it gives no variation in the expectation value of position. So that's the main point, and uh, we'll see you guys in class.